Amen. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory Christ. Christ is in our midst. He is in our midst. So, there's so many things that we could talk about in such a short amount of time. Uh, they've been at the seminary and the monastery for a long time, taught at the seminary for, oh, I think too long. <laughs> 20, 20 years almost. Uh, but it's always a great blessing to be able to help in the process of not only facilitating uh, the formation of priests, which is really, really important, obviously, because they don't come from the sky, but they, they come from, you know, the seminary, the factory of that place. And to have a monastery next to the seminary, you know, this is what St. Tikhon of Moscow always wanted. He, uh, from what we understand, he grew up near us and went to a seminary that had a monastery connected to it. So he understood the importance of just how uh, necessary that context of prayer was for um, the, the formation of, of Orthodox priests, deacons, uh, uh, and those who would be teaching in the, in the church and whatnot. That life of prayer is something that is, is uh, epitomized most importantly by, uh, I think one person told, said one time, he said, uh, Orthodoxy is about uh, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> You know, this is this is how it goes, and this is based really in the Psalms. The Psalms say, "Be still and what?" Oh, right. It's we don't think our way into the kingdom of heaven. Um, we don't. Uh, you know, the thought of God is extremely important because it's something that we need to 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 add into our lives, moment by moment, day by day. Just the thought of God, because the thought of God begets prayer to God. So. I wonder what's like. Well, how do I start this journey of spiritual life if I'm if I maybe seem to be have gone, gone away from the church or gone away from God, or even if I don't really know exactly what to do, or if I, you know, we all need help and direction. And there's always a time, never a time not to make a new beginning. You know, there's always these desert fathers. You know, they they either make a mistake or they have this problem or that problem, and then the, they come to the to the other person that they either offended or what they maybe they offended them, and they said, "Forgive me, dear father." He says, "I haven't even made a beginning." These are people who've been in the desert for decades. They have that perspective that spiritual life is always about beginning. It's always about just being present to God right now in this moment and starting again. We see that in the parable of the prodigal son on uh, that we're going to, you know, we have all these Lenten Sundays that are coming up, uh, pre-Lenten Sundays. And the pro prodigal son is this, this typical situation that we often find ourselves in is that we forget God. We go away from God. Uh, we get busy. Um, it may not be anything like a, of, of great uh, detriment in the sense of like, you know, we didn't rob a bank or hurt anybody, but we forget God. And really, St. Mark of uh, the ascetic, he says the principal giant that undergirds all of the other passions, which are the vices, you know, uh, lust, greed, envy, pride, anger, all of those things, he says is the forgetfulness of God. The forgetfulness of God. The other two are laziness and ignorance. So he says those three things, they're called the three spiritual giants. They undergird all of the other passions, all the other problems, sins, things that lead us away from God. So the principal beginning that we need to make on a moment by moment, day by day basis is this remembrance of God. To bring not only the thought of God into our lives, but also through that, a prayer to God, an inner turning of the heart. And if we were going to epitomize prayer as anything, we say, well, what is prayer? Prayer is an inner turning of the heart to the Lord. This inner turning of the heart to the Lord constitutes the mechanic, the beginning, middle, and end mechanic of real prayer. Because when I turn to God in my own heart and say, here I am, Lord, it's then that somehow I begin to participate in the energies of God, which are everywhere present and filling all things. It's in that moment that God turns to me. So Christ says in the book of Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice, let him open the door and I will come in and we will sup. We'll have communion together. Um, so this knocking of God at the door of the heart uh, is, is really something that's going on all the time. God's always knocking. Sometimes through difficulties, sometimes through sorrows, sometimes through pain, sometimes through joy, sometimes through good things. But at all times in every place, St. Maximus says, God is working out the salvation of all men, all men and women everywhere. God is at all times in every place through his providence. He's trying to save us. This is our God. He wills, you know, there's always um, a few things that we can know in life. It's like, what is the will of God, right? People always ask this question. What is the will of God for me? It's like, well, 
There's very few things that God directly wills in our life and says, okay, you shouldn't buy that car, you should buy this car. You shouldn't go to this school, you should go to that school. Um, those aren't really things that, that God has an, an innate will about. Um, the most important recourse that we have is to the scriptures to know the commandments of God as a general platform or a general form or a pattern for our lives to conform ourselves to the known and revealed will of God. But the one thing that we can say for certain is that God wills the salvation of all men and women every, every place, everywhere. That is God's will. God's will is our salvation. So anybody that says that there are certain people that are not saved and that some people God has chosen to be saved and that others he's not, that is not biblical. That is not even scriptural. And that is not, it's not good. It's a terrible thought. That somehow God created, you know, because there are some Christian groups that say that. We don't believe that. We believe that what the scripture says, God wills the salvation of all men. And another thing that the scripture says that's the will of God, which is very rare in the scripture, we say, here's God's will. It says, this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. You give thanks for everything. Very interesting. That's God's will, that we're thankful. We're Eucharistic. That our lives become Eucharistic. Why? Through this how? Through this orientation of thanksgiving towards God for everything. This is what really changes the dynamic in our life. Our attitude, you know, like, uh, there's very few things that we can change sometimes on the outside. We're very busy sometimes, you know, there's that old saying. When I was uh, very young, I wanted to change the world. I got a little older, middle aged. I decided I would just work on the people around me. <laughs> this is too big. And then I and then I got a lot older and I realized I, I can't do that. I'm just going to try to work on myself. And at the end of the day, the only thing that I can really change about myself in real time on a kind of simple, more easier than not basis, because there's some proclivities that we have, some dispositions that we have. We have a lot of tough things about ourselves, things we don't like. I have a bunch of things about myself I don't like. I'm working on them. Um, what is that saying? Like, God loves you and I'm trying. Um, that's kind of where I'm at, you know, at least with myself. But this uh, capacity in us is our attitude. My attitude. I could change my attitude. Like, that's repentance is about a change of mind. Really, that's what the word literally means. Metanoia, change of mind. And oftentimes that's something on a deeper level that God himself grants to us if we ask for it, if we're open to it, and somehow God's grace is working with us and there's a bit of a, a synergy going on, a symphony between us. Somehow that repentance is born I'm like, oh, I really want to change my life and do something different. I want to be different. I want to think differently. I want to approach the church differently and other people differently. Um, but on a basic real-time level, I could change my attitude right now about how my life is going about how I'm responding to situations in my life, how I'm responding to you, how I'm responding to, to other people, how I'm responding to whatever situations that are being given to me. I ultimately have the one thing that's like kind of an immediate thing, I could change my attitude. And the easiest way to do that is just to be thankful. Here we are. I, I mean, I got shoes. I got glasses. Somebody drove me in a car. I didn't have to drive. I had breakfast this morning. I could be thankful for all these things. My rias is not too too worn, you know. It only has one hole. I noticed a new hole in my casting though this morning. I was rather disappointed about that, but I can deal with it. At least I don't have more. Got on a plane the other day. I came all the way down here. I mean, it's just amazing. We were hurtling through the air at 500 miles an hour. Uh, I was able to use my cell phone and contact people in outer space, you know, down to the ground. I mean, things were going pretty good, you know. I can be thankful. I can be thankful for all those things. Even for the bad things in my life, I have to learn how to be thankful for. I have to learn how to use those things to become better, to be, at the very least, more compassionate and sensitive to you. All the bad stuff that's gone on in my life and all the bad stuff that's gone on in your life, I can become more compassionate through that. I can become more sensitive. I don't have to become cynical because of those things. I can become better through them. That's my choice. My choice of attitude. So that's kind of a basic baseline thing if we were to say well what is a spiritual point that we could enact just right now my attitude is is really the one thing i can always try to work on and even with a prayer to god lord help me to think better about this person lord help me to be better disposed right now sometimes we have bad days you know 
And I think that's oftentimes for our humility because we're not perfect by any means. But that fact that I'm not in complete control even of myself is humbling. And so how do I use those bad days? I'm humbled by it. I realize I'm not God. I realize that God is God and I'm not God and that I'm not ultimately in control of this world, but the Lord is. So when we talk about the life of prayer, the life of prayer in, that church, the, in our church, the inner turning of the heart to the Lord, no matter where you're at and no matter what you're doing, we can always turn to the Lord. We can always add in the thought of God into our life because that is the principal thing that we forget. That God is everywhere present, filling all things. God is everywhere, and I'm not present to that fact. I'm not here in a way. Sometimes I'm distracted. Sometimes I'm thinking about other things. I'm worrying about this. I'm upset about that, and I'm really not present to my life and sometimes to you because of the distractions. And distraction, you know, some of the fathers say that that's the beginning of, of certain sins. So distraction is never really a good thing. It's something that we need to work towards trying to integrate and have integrity in our lives so that we're present to the people that are in front of us. And really, I mean, spiritual life is about you. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about the other. Christianity has this miraculous vision that it imparts to the world that the other is Christ. In that you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Were you kind to somebody? You were kind to Christ. Were you loving to somebody who was unlovable? You were loving to Christ. Did you give something to somebody else that was in need? You gave it to the Lord. This is our reference point because why we're always adding in that thought of God and that prayer to God thought of God and the prayer that begets that. That remembrance of God, St. Basil says, is the presence of God. He says the remembrance of God is the presence of God. And so our life of prayer in the church, the way that the church teaches us to pray, um, is very exceptional. Um, I've traveled all through the world. I've studied all religions. I have degrees and all sorts of things. And basically I can tell you this. Orthodoxy has the most complete, cohesive, and coherent spiritual worldview of how to understand the world, how to understand our anthropology, who we are, men and women, how to understand God, who God is, and how to pray, how to speak to God. And what does prayer give us? It gives us the capacity, if we do it consistently, if we do it regularly, if it becomes a part of our life, the more it's a part of our daily existence in the sense of moment by moment, day by day, it gives us the capacity to be more responsive and less reactive. I cease being the victim. Oh, here comes that person again. Oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> and then we kind of you know, fall apart, right? Oh, here's my boss. Here's my neighbor. Here's my... Uh, I'm a big... No, because once I cease to be reactive, I'm no longer victimized. You can't tyrannize me anymore if I'm responsive, and responsivity is precisely what Christ asks us to be, asks us to do, to choose how to respond in love to those around us. If I can't love you, then it's for certain that I don't love God. That's what St. John's uh, epistle says, right? It says if we, if we say that we love God and we don't like our neighbor, hate our neighbor, he says we're not being truthful, we're not... It's not, this is not real. This is not right. Love of God begins with you. So how I treat you, and, you know, that doesn't mean that we're always, you know, the perfect people because we all have difficulties. Again, it's for our humility. But how to see the other and, and use that as a springboard to Christ. And really, that is the message of our faith and of, this, of, of the life of the church, how to use this world as a means unto God, to go through this world to find God, Rather than to just leave it opaque and kind of mundane, the church lifts the veil of this world and it shows us what it really is. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaim his handiwork. His invisible attributes are clearly seen, St. Paul says, being understood by the things that are made. His invisible attributes by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. This is how we come to the knowledge of God. We don't try to circumvent this world. We don't think our way into heaven. We don't philosophize ourselves about, uh, you know, various um, religious thoughts. It's precisely through our daily life and in our daily life that we bring God into that, the thought of God, a prayer to God, 
and that through that we springboard to the Lord himself and find God, <coughs> find God in our daily existence. This world is not mundane. We take the most mundane things in the entire world, bread and wine, and then we take them into the altar, which is kind of the most, the place where the presence of God in this world is the most dense. If anything, this is a little citadel that's been taken back uh, from the corruption of the world, this little enclave of the Holy Spirit Orthodox Church. This is a little citadel for God, kind of being retaken for the kingdom. We take that most elemental and simple and basic thing, we take it into that altar. And we offer it on that altar with thanks and with prayer. And through that thanksgiving and through that prayer, it becomes for us communion. The most basic things in this world become a revelatory point of us to enter into the knowledge and to the life and to the mystery of God. And that pattern of anaphora, you know, that, that part is called the anaphora, the Eucharistic canon, all of the anaphoras, lifting up and thanksgiving, it gives us a pattern of how to live our lives. That we take everything in our life, we take it into the altar of the heart, we offer it up to God and we say, thank you, even for this, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Somehow you're working, Lord, because I believe that all things work for the greater good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Romans, right? Chapter 8. Everything's working for good, even the bad. God makes good out of it. Like it says in Job, you know, the devil meant this for bad, but God turned it to good. So that pattern of the liturgy is just giving us, showing us how to live. And we take everything and we offer it up to God, even the most basic things. And that's why prayer is just something that needs to become more a part of our life, not only consistently like as a prayer rule. Unfortunately, I have um, my uh, uh, book is sold out. Uh, my book had a prayer, it has a prayer rule and it. it has a lot of good information and so forth. I had five copies. I went out there. I thought Father had forgotten to put them all out. And all the coffee as well. I went out there. I said, oh, Father, did you put the things out? I said, yes, I did. I said, well, where did they all go? There might be uh, one, of your, one or two of your books in our books. Ah, good. Well, I'll grab one. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm out at home. But that prayer rule in there, and you can find it on Amazon, of course. Um, but that prayer rule in there is kind of just the most consistent, basic prayer rule that you can do on a, on a daily basis that... You know, one of the keys to prayer is consistency. It's not about how long I pray for how long and then I'm just done. It's more about how often can I consistently meet the Lord in a measured way that I can actually do in a way that's effective and pray in an orthodox way that actually helps me to be, again, more responsive, less reactive, more able to see this world as, as a sign from God of his love, of his mercy, of his goodness, and really, it's through the asceticism of the, the church teaches us, you know, we're coming to the season of Lent. Asceticism in and of itself is, you know, people think it's a bad word. It's not. It's precisely through the ascetic life of the church, which sounds kind of scary, but it's not. Because people do asceticism all the time in the name of health and wealth. I mean, people work themselves to death. It's very ascetical to make money, you know. And yet we in the church, we could work ourselves a little bit and acquire some spiritual capital and be benefited even more. But in this world, we always have to work. That's called ascesis or asceticism. But it's just a matter of where we direct it to. You know, a little bit of work in prayer will yield amazing and multiple results. You know, you like a good return, don't you? Most of you probably have some kind of IRA or some kind of uh, retirement fund, right? Who doesn't like a good return? Prayer is like, you know, if you're getting 5% right now, which is good, prayer will give you 20. You get 25% back, maybe even 50. Depends on the day, you get 100, maybe 1,000. I mean, God's the giver of all of those things, but really, the return is great. A little bit of work goes a very, very long way in that way if it's consistent, if it's consistent. So... In that, that prayer rule, you know, again, it starts, it starts with that understanding of that prayer is, as St. John Climacus says, you know, it's very important for us to define prayer first and foremost. Number one, I have so many thoughts, you know, there's not a lot of time, so I kind of lose my train of thought. I go to all over the place, you know. But number one, prayer, there, there's a certain depth of prayer. You know, there's four different kinds of prayer that we could say just off of the um, top of my head. 
Um, there's verbal prayer, which is the most basic form of prayer. Say, God, help me. Lord, have mercy. Then there's prayer of the mind, which is me kind of thinking about prayer and trying to talk to God. And then we go even deeper and we go into something called prayer of the heart, which is really orthodox prayer. Orthodox prayer of the heart is when our mind puts, we put our mind or our attention into our heart, our physical heart, which is both spiritual and physical at the same time, put our mind into our heart and from there we speak to God. So it's not just verbal. And a lot of times the more proficient you become in prayer, the more you'll move from verbal to mental to heart. Uh, within the space that you're actually praying, you'll actually go through all of those stages. And in the end, we get to the fourth stage of prayer where it becomes, it's called self-activated. It's actually a force within us that becomes alive. And it's like a, a burning, you know, it's like uh, trying to get a fire going. Um, you know, it keeps getting put out by difficulties, by our own um, lack of commitment, uh, by um, the circumstances of life, it gets blown out. Well, this is, it's like fire, you keep adding logs to and it becomes so big that it actually is just, it's on fire and it's going by itself. Prayer can become that kind of state for us as we progress and become more proficient in prayer. That is the life of the saints. Saints have that. They have this this power within them, this fire, this self-activated. It's God. It's God in them. St. Gregory Sinai says, in its highest form, prayer is God himself in us. We become the living temples of the Holy Spirit, which is what St. Paul says. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Well, where's the altar? It's right here in the heart. And for me, one of the most important mm, mechanical kind of aspects of prayer is, is that I... I realize that there's all of that depth and complexity to the life of prayer. So it's like, it's not just one dimensional and I'm just kind of talking to God. Amen. It's about this very complex kind of a multifaceted reality that's very deep. Um, that's, that's, that's so uh, much an art that it's actually, you know, St. Sophronius says it's more, uh, it's easier, he says, to build skyscrapers than it is to pray consistently and deeply and uh, coherently over long periods of time. He says it's much easier to do some kind of, um, you know, make a building or something like that. Uh, so it's tough work. But we shouldn't be discouraged. All we have to do is try. And we just have to try a little bit. But prodigal son gives us the, the most elemental mechanic of prayer, which is the most necessary. When the prodigal son, he comes out of the father's house, which they see as the image of the heart, actually, which is where the kingdom is which is what uh, you know, Christ himself says, the kingdom of heaven is not over there. It's not over there, but it's where? It's inside. So it's not just a, a platitude. It's an actual thing where physically it's inside you. And most importantly, it's inside you because of baptism. The grace of baptism has been imparted to you and it's buried like the pearl of great price in your heart. So one of the fathers says the task for us is to uncover that grace and to make that spark burn brighter and brighter and brighter to add the more of the kindling of our attention and of our life into that spark and make it a fire within us, which is the light of God that's been given to us from day one in the church. <laughs> it's already there waiting. So the prodigal son, he leaves the father's house and he goes out into the world, which is the passions and sins and so forth. He lives a terrible life, etc. And then, before he actually goes back to his father's house, it says something very important in the scripture, that he came to himself. Came to himself. Four words. This is the first beginning of real prayer of the heart. We have to come back to ourselves. Everything in this world, and the, the very nature of the fall itself is something that pulls us out of ourselves. We're distracted. We're over here. We're over there, you know, even when I'm trying to pray or even focus, maybe I'm still thinking about other things. I might be at home right now thinking about my sick godfather, or I might be uh, thinking about something I forgot to do. I could be innumerable places besides here and present. But a real fundamental aspect of St. John Damascus says that in order for us to have communion with God, we need to first have communion with ourselves. We shouldn't take it as a given. We shouldn't just say, oh, yeah, I just assume that we're, we're okay. We're fallen. What is the essence of the fall? This movement away from myself, which is away from my heart, which is away from the kingdom, which is away from God. So the first task for me is to put my attention, 
my physical attention back into my physical being, back into my physical heart. And from there, to say my prayer to God. But that movement back to self unto God, it's twofold and one in the same. A lot of times our prayers are not answered because we're just up here going blah, 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 blah. Verbal prayer, and we're not even connected to ourselves. We're just kind of talking to God. Father Zechariah says that we God can't hear us if we're speaking to him outside of our heart. Outside of the home of the Father, the house of the Father. So it's interesting because in St. Dionysus, he has this very interesting idea that he says that um, the mountain of transfiguration, the altar of the Orthodox Church, and the heart of man are all one in the same place. The, the Mount of Transfiguration, the altar of the Orthodox Church, and the heart of each one of us is actually one in the same place. And the only way that we can actually experience that is when we go inside and we when, when we go inside and we find God and we realize He was here, but He's also in here, but He was also up on the mountain. It's one in the same God. It's one and the same God. So what is, where is the closest place that you're going to find God? If you're like anywhere on planet Earth, where is the closest place that you're going to actually find the Lord? If not inside your own heart, right? The kingdom of heaven is actually inside you, and most especially through baptism. But the heart is the place that God wants to dwell. God's throne is actually supposed to be in the heart. He's supposed to be enthroned on the heart. And the mystery of the heart is not some kind of um, easy task to unpack and just to kind of be cliche about. The heart is the deepest mystery that we can point at. The greatest mystery in this room is you. And the epicenter of that mystery is your heart. And that heart is an unfathomable deep that is capable of containing God. Created for God. Created to contain God. Created to know God. Created to live with God. Created to walk with God. That was the natural state of us when we were made in the beginning. Very important for us to understand from an ontological standpoint that we weren't created from this way and we came to this place right now. We were created from this way and we came to this place right now. When God first made man, and you, you can see this even, you know, if you look at the fossil record and everything, this does bear itself out. That somehow there is all these kind of interesting hominids and strange, um, you know, cro man and so forth. And then there's a missing link. And all of a sudden about 8,000 years ago, boom, Sky appears, man, totally different, totally kind of similar. Maybe God was working, you know, like kind of model clay or something like that. I don't know. But then here's man. All of a sudden on the fossil record, there's just no preemptive kind of record of this, this guy. We call him Adam. It means dirt. Here's this guy. He appears on 8,000 years ago. There he is in the fossil record. And even in, I remember reading uh, several uh, science um Journals that said, well, finally, we have traced back all the DNA from everybody on planet Earth back to one man and one woman. Two. One man and one woman, two people. Yeah. And I thought it was just... Well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are two people there. Yeah. Okay, one lady. <laughs> one guy, one lady. So, but those people were created in communion with God. And somehow that communion was broken. And really, it's very easy to understand because we also replicate the fall of Adam in our own lives. So often we have a little garden, typically. You know, if you have an ideal home, not everybody did. I didn't, but we all have our little garden, the mom and the dad and the kids. It's kind of like a garden of Eden, the, such childlike simplicity, such easy obedience. Everything's nice. Everything's beautiful. So simple, so nice. And then the fall, age 13. <laughs> right age 13 and down we go everybody kind of goes down a little bit maybe some people a little later some people a little earlier but we all kind of experience that movement away from God and away from mom and dad and that's replicated inside of us that simplicity in the garden of delight which you know we call the home and mom and dad which are kind of an image of, 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 of God you know in the sense of God's given us to, to us in this life it's a trinity, you know, there's in a family, you know, have father, mother, child. It's, it's a Trinitarian kind of thing. It's very stable, too. You know, it's like this. 
A tripod is the most stable uh, thing that we have. Two, two poles don't really work as well, and four are kind of clumsy. But three is that, that's the model of parent and uh, two parents and one child. But we go away from, from them and from God, and then we come back. Then we come back, but we ourselves kind of replicate or, or kind of experience that, that, that garden experience, the fall, and then the return in our own lives. Um, it's something that we have to understand, and it's something that Adam had to understand as well. Because he was inexperienced. He was very naive, very childlike. Um, God actually had to kind of kick him out of the garden because he said that if he would have left him there, it wasn't like God was being mean. <clears throat> Number one, death came in because God knew that it would be kind of a, a like a, a wake-up call for man. Uh-oh, I better get myself together. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to die at some point. I don't know when that is. Um, it's the same thing for us. Death, even though it's, it's innately like alien to the creation and it, very important for us to understand that from an orthodox perspective, death is the only enemy. Sin is not the big problem. Sin is the, the child or the byproduct of death. If we didn't have death as a congenital inheritance, there'd be no sin. Death is the, is, is the mother of corruption, which leads us towards doing the things that we don't want to do, the things that are bad, the things that are wrong. Death is the problem. It, it, tends, it trends us towards things which are corrupt. It's the deep inheritance inside of our nature. We didn't inherit guilt from Adam. We inherited mortality. It's called ancestral sin. We don't believe in original sin. We don't believe in original sin that we got Adam's guilt. That's a Western concept. What did we get from Adam, our forefather, whether it's our current forefather or the ones from, from many generations ago? The inheritance of mortality. And the book of Sirach says very clearly, he said, God does not delight in the death of the living because God did not create death. It came by the will of man who went away from life. So Christ comes. The epicenter of the orthodox phenomenon is what? What's the center of our faith? What do we kind of wait for every year and everything turns around? Pascha. Right? Christmas is nice, but Pascha is really the the pole of which everything kind of rotates around. We're paschal centric, which is the victory over death. Christ comes to destroy death and him who had the power of death, which is the devil, and to free those who all their life were tyrannized by the subject and fear of bondage to death. That's what St. Paul says in Hebrews. So that's the enemy. That's the problem. And so our mortality is something that we need to fight against because it corrupts our minds, our hearts, it makes us depressed sometimes and upset and this and that. That all comes from that congenital inheritance of death. Christ himself, he says, I come that they might have what? Abundant. And that they might have it what? Abundant. More abundantly. That's who Jesus is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. It's a very simple kind of answer <laughs> to the very difficult question of like, well, how does God forgive all of our sins and how do they go away and how do we get better and all this stuff because we're united to life and we overcome the death and then we don't want to sin the saints they overcome the death within themselves that mortality by being united to him who is life itself that paschal centered epicenter of the church and from that springs forth their sinlessness and their holiness so if we get rid of death everything else is solved in the sense of like we don't want to sin. Why? Because it's been healed within us. Like St. Paul says, I do the things I don't want to do. And the things that I want to do, I don't do. And he said, who will deliver me from this body of what? Death. 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 Very important. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus who gives us the victory. Same, uh, Father Zechariah says that, he says, if we believe that death is something which is natural, he says, we will vanish in oblivion. He says, but if we believe and understand that death is something to be fought against, the very primary enemy, he says, it is only then that Christ's victory can become ours mm -hmm. and that we will share in his victory forever. So we don't want to see it as something, you know, God can use it. It's a part of the created order now. God kind of makes it so he puts the fear of God in us because we know that, oh, whoops, I could mess up and then I would be over. And, you know, it, it does kind of keep us. However, it wasn't originally intended in the sense of like, that was the way it was supposed to be. Why did Adam live for 900 years? You know, Noah, right? All these people, they lived for so long. Why? Because it's, it's, it's the reality of it. As they got farther away from paradise, farther away from God, they got farther away from life. 
And then God finally put a cap on it after Noah. He's like, okay, 120 years, everybody. That's it. It's the maximum you get. There might be one, 121 somewhere, you know, in China, but 120 is kind of like the cap, you know? That's it. And so when we understand prayer, right? So we're looking for, the question is how to overcome death. Well, if we want to be united with God, we have to pray. The only way that we understand prayer properly is, is as we understand St. John Climacus' definition of prayer, which says prayer is three words. Prayer is converse and union. Prayer is converse and union with God. It's our conversation with God that affects our union with God. So the most important thing for us to be doing is speaking to God. Just like Moses, it said he spoke to God as one would speak to a friend. And from that place, he began to shine with un unbearable light, so much so that he had to cover his face because people couldn't bear it. It was his conversation with God that affected his union with God. And it's no different for us. If we want to have that life which Christ has promised in the gospel, it is our converse that will affect our union with God. And union with God is salvation. Most important thing we can say is that prayer, we have to understand it as, as Elder Milino says, is prayer as communion. It is communion. It's an easy way, simple way, not easy, simple way for us to receive communion, for us to receive communion and union with God. There's always a saying that some people go to communion and they receive communion, but they don't receive communion. Other people are at the liturgy and they receive communion. And they didn't receive communion. Why? Right here. Right here. It's the heart. The heart itself is kind of the question of the day. And, you know, St. Uh, McCary says a wonderful quote about that mystery of the heart, about how the Father quoted it to me last night. I was so pleased. Because <laughs> it's like one of my favorite quotes. And Father said, oh, yeah, you know this quote. I know this quote. It's a great quote. He told me the quote. I was like, that's my quote. <laughs> <laughs> I read it all the time to people. Because... The, the, the mystery is the heart. It's the place where God wants to dwell, and really, it's the center of the person. And if we were to say one word that epitomizes Orthodox theology, thought, and life, it's the word person. Person. We're person because we're the image of the person. It's the person of God. The person of Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three co-eternal persons, co-reigning, co-equal, co-eternal and yet one essence, one being. You know, it's so important for us to understand that the Trinity, it's one being. It's one God, three persons. And just as they live in a multi-hypostatic way, multiplicity of persons, hypostatic person, that's, that word means the same thing, per, uh, hypo, hypostasis, hypostatic, means person. They live in this multi-person, multi-hypostatic way. We also, too, are called to live in the same way, Multi-hypostatic, we actually only have one being, one nature. And we're all called to be one, like Christ says, that they may be one as we are. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. How do we become perfect in one? It says, unite us in the services. It says, unite us in the one will of thy commandments. So that we co-inhere, actually, in each other, in a Trinitarian kind of perichoresis in the church. The more open, the more transparent, the more prayerful, the more humble, the more well-disposed we are, the more filled we are with God's grace, the more we're united to each other. Abba Dorothea says this wonderful thing where he says it's like a circle. God is at the center, and the more that we move closer to God, we're actually moving closer to each other as well. And that unity takes place naturally through being united with God, with each other as well. So person. God as person. You know, this concept was something that was... Um, we look at all the concepts and, and thought of the church. Like, let's say just like the word logos, right? Logos. Everybody knows what logos is, right? In our key and in logo, in the beginning was the word, the logos. The logos was with God and the logos was... That word itself had a tremendous journey through Greek philosophers, through various means and measures and all throughout the world of being developed and, and kind of uh, crystallized and, and mm, uh, somehow formed through the forge of humanity to get it to the point where St. John could actually use it in the right context when he said anarchy and logos. In the beginning was the word. 
It took a lot of process for people and humanity to come to a crystallizing point to understand what that was. It didn't just happen like people, you know, you go to the Hebrew person and you say the word logos. They're like, huh? Logos. What is that? It wouldn't have been understood by most people, at least in the ancient world, and only some people in St. John's time. But there's an incredible Hellenization that took place in the Hebrew nation where there's a great mix of Hellenistic thought and Greek thought, and they kind of married. And that's where we get the Septuagint. Right? What is the Septuagint? The, uh, it's the, the 70. It's the Old Testament translated into Greek by order of the king of the day. I can't remember. Was it Ptolemus or who was it? Ptolemaeus. <clears throat> so it is, it's God's providential working throughout all places and all times to, to try to save us, to try to bring the message of salvation. And these terms and concepts just, just weren't there. We should, we should not take that for granted, how much work it was for St. John the Evangelist to eventually be able to say with the right clarity, with the right nuance, with the right subtlety, with the right precision, in the beginning was the Logos. It's a very unique term. We have a lot of other terms like that, and one of them is person. Up until the first and second ecumenical councils, the word person didn't mean what it means today. It was developed, it was crystallized, it was formulated, it was forged in the furnace of those councils. So many things in our modern world are actually byproducts of the life, culture, faith, and work of the church, the early church, the first thousand years. So many things. You know who was the first hospital? Who, who made it? You know who that was? St. Basil. Basil. Right? Nobody had hospitals before that. You're like, what's a hospital? Person sick. Oh, too bad. <laughs> you know, there was, there was no place. If you had a good doctor, well, then you were lucky. You know, maybe you went to the medicine man. I don't know. Oh, there's that great uh, story about St. Innocent. You remember, remember the medicine man and St. Innocent story? St. Innocent Alaska, I'm sorry to diverge, but can't help myself. St. Innocent Alaska was a missionary, great missionary to Alaska, and uh, doing a lot of work. It was about 1840 to 1860. His main amount of work was done as a bishop. I think he was like 10 or 20 years before that as a priest. Um, but he was journeying to uh, different islands uh, throughout Alaska. And there's many, many, many islands, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you know. And he went to uh, this one uh, island, and uh, there was a man. Uh, well, these people were on the shore waiting for St. Innocent as he pulled up in his little boat. You can imagine how difficult it was to, to travel in those days in these little boats and so forth in the middle of winter and all sorts of times and seasons. And they came out and they said, we've been waiting for you. St. Innocent says, I've never been here before. He says, we know. He says, our, our medicine man knew all about you, and he knows all about orthodoxy, and he wants us to bring you to him. St. Innocent was very puzzled. You know, this is something that's actually in his diaries and notes and so forth. Um, he wrote it to the bishop, and uh, they take him to the, to, the, to the shaman of the tribe, which was not really a shaman. They said he was just kind of more like the elder, and he was very pious and very devout. And the man told him, he said, an angel appeared to me several years ago, and he told me that you'd be coming. And he also told me all about orthodoxy. He told me about the creed. He told me about this and all these things. He told him about all these things that he had no way of ever actually knowing about. But he had startling clarity about the precision doc doctrines and understanding of the Orthodox Church. And he, he told St. Innocent all about it. And St. Innocent was just blown away. He got his village all ready to receive orthodoxy. They were all baptized and chrismated. And St. Innocent asked him, he said, can I, can I meet this angel? And the man said, well, I meet with him, you know, a few times a week, let me ask him. <laughs> and he wrote to the bishop, he said, I think it was like him some back and forth, and he came back to the island a few times, and he asked the bishop, can I ask him to, if I can meet the angel? And the bishop says, you have my blessing. So he went back, he said, can I meet him? He said, I'll ask. And St. Innocent and the, the man said yes, and then St. Innocent said, no, I don't want to. <laughs> it's okay. I, I, it's kind of scary, you know, if you think, to, you know, presumptuous of sorts. So he was so humble, he said, it's okay, never mind. Fascinating, though, about angels. Back to person. That concept of person is something that was not understood as it is today. And even now, today, 
uh, the most important thing we can say about person, it is, the, it is the image of God in us. That capacity within us that's completely free and self-determining, like unto God. Total choices, like right now I could just kind of run out of here. Say, what was wrong with Father Sturgis? Well, he had free will. He decided to go. Do whatever he wants. You know, it's that, it's that capacity that's that we have a choice to do anything. Even bad things. God endowed us with such godlike freedom that we could even do the bad things, even to reject him. This is kind of the peril of free will, but it's also the gift. St. Sophroni has a wonderful quote. He says, when God made man, he made nothing less than himself. When God made man, he made nothing less than himself. He is the image. We are created in the image. Christ is the image of the invisible God. So what he is, is he's actually the prototype, the archetypal man. Shows us everything that we are, everything we need to do, everything we need to be, everything we need to become, how to do it, and really what the true ontology, the real end point of all of us was from the very beginning. This is the great revelation of who we are. Christ is not somehow an exception in that regard. He's actually the model archetypal model for all of us showing us how we too can be so united with God just like the saints that God can dwell in us and we can dwell in God that we could actually be one with God and God could be one with us and that that union would be so close and so intimate and so um, um, sacred marriage gives us the closest image of it in this world St. Paul talks about this in the 5th chapter of Ephesians he says that Husbands, love your wives, do this, do that, you know, love, blah, 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 all the sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. But he says, but I'm actually speaking about Christ in the church. So I'm telling you about all this about marriage, and I say, what? There's something higher that's actually, point, that marriage is pointing to, which is our marriage with Christ, our marriage with God. That's what we were created for. That's why God made us. God created us for union, that we might know him, and that through that knowledge, we ourselves would share in his life, through that communion and become eternal ourselves forever. So person, as given by the Second Ecumenical Council, was that understanding of the unique kind of quality of each one of us as made in the image and of the true revelation of which is found only in Christ himself. He showed us what person is. It was through understanding him that we understood ourselves. It was through understanding God that we actually understood our world more. And we'll find that in our own lives. The closer that we come to God, the more we'll understand about ourselves. The more we'll understand about each other, the more we'll understand about the moon and the stars and all of these things. They actually come from the knowledge of God. It's a byproduct of it. If I draw near to God, I'm actually coming closer to myself as well. So the heart is this very center of the person. And the heart is something which is very deep. And one of the fathers said that, you know, when we talk about a uh, person or the hypostatic principle, that's the same phrase, it's a Greek phrase for person, the hypostatic principle, they said, hypostatic principle is the capacity in each one of us to embrace infinity, to embrace God. It's that capacity within us. It's like the kind of the, the receptor point of being able to receive God himself. The fullness of man and the fullness of God in ourselves. But it's still a mystery. We could kind of point at it and I could give you some definitions, but again, in the end, person will be mystery. The center of that person is your heart. Heart will be mystery. And the very center of that is the noose, which is the eye of the heart, which is always floating around. You know, we talk about how uh, people say the noose. What is the noose? It's our attention. Wherever your attention is, that's where your noose is. So that's why I tell you, put your attention back into your physical heart and from there speak to God. That is the first mechanic of prayer, the first rule of prayer. When I speak to God, I come back to my own heart and from that place I speak to God. And it becomes a very easy and natural movement for me, but it's something that I'm, oh, it's, because of the fall, it's still counterintuitive. When I go down to pray, like when I'm praying in my room, how do I pray? Sorry for those who are at home, I won't, I won't be able to show you this. 
But, you know, I find that the easiest way to pray is, uh, you know, and of course, maybe some of you it's more difficult to, to uh, kneel, so standing is fine. But we're talking about busy casting prayer, which is kind of what, that word of stillness or silence. Be still and know that I'm God. That's Hezekiah in Greek. That stillness or that quietness that we need to cultivate to be able to listen to God, it's a whole attitude of prayer, really. It's not, it's not just like me saying words, the right words, and then somehow like the doors open and I get in. It's, it's a disposition of, of heart whereby I'm listening and attentive and receptive to God and I'm watchful. One of the easiest ways that the watchfulness comes about is through the Jesus prayer. But the Jesus prayer still in the end will be just a tool. It's just a tool by which I can facilitate this state. So I like to kneel, just kind of like the more Romanian way, um, but other people have it as well. My feet get kind of cramped when I do this. But so, and then I'm actually so when I'm praying, typically I'm kind of like this, you know. Like, uh, and you don't have to do this, but I'm just showing you like there's an inward kind of actual physical movement that's happening happening here, where I'm coming back to self unto God. And even like let's say I've had a busy day or something like that, it becomes very almost counterintuitive. I think, what am I doing? My, my, my head is going, what's going on? And my heart says, shut up. And my head's like, no, 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 no. And my heart says, no, shh. And my head's like, no, 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 no. So this uh, is, it's not something that just comes naturally to us. So, but even as I'm, as I'm kneeling, I'm, I'm actually putting like my physical attention back into my physical heart. And from there, I'm saying Jesus Christ. But I'm actually facilitating with my body. The body has to be involved in prayer. Prayer has to come from my body because it's that's who I am. If I think that somehow I can think my way into heaven, yeah, I'm, I'm a philosopher and a fool. You know, it's really something that is 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 whole person. It's 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 holistic. It has integrity, and that's where that word holiness comes from or wholeness. It's about be, me becoming myself, being being back, coming back to myself, and then unto God. It's counterintuitive, but you get used to it. It's called cyclical prayer. Back to self unto God. Back to self unto God. And so as I'm praying, I'm constantly coming back to myself. And then I'm praying. And then I kind of start getting dispersed, and then I come back to myself, and I speak to God. The Jesus prayer is kind of like a flashlight. What we're looking for is we're not, you know, it's not the goal. It's a very powerful flashlight, you know. St. Isaac the Syrian says that the name of Jesus is actually light. The name is light. There's an ontological tie between us and our name. So if you say, Father Sergius, and we're in the coffee hour or whatever, I'll be like, yes, uh -huh, I'm coming right over. And you call my name, and here I come. Right? Because I am bound up in my name. And even if you write my name on a board, if you misspell it, I get upset. <laughs> because I'm in my name. Sometimes I get mail, it's Father Sergius. They, they mix the U and the I. So S-E-R-G-U-I-S, -E Sir Goo-is, that's not my name. You get very upset, right? Because your name is you. You are your name, and you say, oh, no, 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 no. I'll misspell your last name, and we'll see how it goes, right? When people misspell my last name, that's not me. We're very bound up with our name. So the name of Jesus is the name, St. Paul says, which is given above every name, at which every knee must bow. All of the powers in this world must bow to that name. All the disorder in ourselves must bow. All the confusion in our heads must bow. If we use that name rightly, it will be a very powerful flashlight which will help us to peer into the depths of our own heart and be watchful, present, and unto God. It orients us Godward. It's not the end point, it's a beginning and it's a tool. So don't ever think it's some kind of mantra or something like that. How, how could we, if we love somebody, sometimes we keep saying their name and thinking about them and do you know what I mean? Like if you're if you're in love with somebody, you're always thinking about them. Oh, I wonder what they're doing. Oh, and then you say their name. Oh, I love that name. That's what we need to be like with God. Thinking about God. It's like, I wonder what God's doing right now. I wonder how God is. It's like, God, here I am. That kind of love that we need to cultivate towards the Lord is, is being mindful of him first and foremost. Saying his name. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. And then coming back to our heart and speaking to him and being present to the mystery of God in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what St. Paul says. So, the heart. Within the heart, St. Macarius says, are unfathomable deep depths. There in the heart are reception rooms and bedchambers, doors and porches, 
porches, many offices and passages. In it is the workshop of righteousness and of wickedness. In it is death and in it is life. The heart is Christ's palace and there Christ the King comes to take his rest. <coughs> with the angels and the spirits of the saints, he dwells in the heart. He walks within the heart and he places his kingdom in the heart. The heart is but a small vessel and yet dragons and lions are there, poisonous creatures. And all the treasuries of wickedness, rough, uneven paths are there and gaping chasms. But there likewise is God. There are the angels, their life in the kingdom, their light and the apostles, the heavenly cities and all the treasuries of grace for all things are in the heart. So it's quite a depth. It's quite a mystery. And it's quite uh, it's something that we need to experience. And that's why we need to come back to our own heart and from there to speak to God. Like the prodigal son, we come to ourselves and we say, I'm going to return home to God. We do this over and over and over and over again. There's never a point in which we stop, stop and uh, not make a beginning. We're always making a beginning back to God, back to the Father's house, which is the heart. And through this movement, God will actually start to hear our prayers. He won't always answer them. You know, they say that God gives three answers to prayers. First one is yes, which is not a lot, but often, sometimes, maybe, once in a while. The other one is not yet. And the third one is I have something better. Those are the three answers for prayers. God never says no. There's no no with God. All the promises of him are yes in Christ Jesus. Yes and yes and yes. Christ is our yes to God. And our yes to Christ is somehow this mm, way in which we become like unto Christ by saying yes to God. No matter what, we say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's our yes to God that is kind of our amen and enables us to find salvation. So difficulties come to us, we say, yes, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Forgive me. Trials, tribulations, all sorts. Of, yes, Lord. I accept, Lord. Only help me and be my strength. These, this life of prayer that we have, very small, short prayers on a consistent basis, especially having a consistent prayer rule, they will change our lives and our lives will begin to open. The opaqueness of this world will be raised and we will see God in everybody and everything and at all times in our life, we'll know that God is working in us, acting in according and willing in us to act in according to his will and for his good purpose. So, I think it's about coffee time. Yes. Yes, everyone says. Let me make a <laughs> suggestion. Okay. Thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Write down a question. There's paper on the back. You can use the living list, turn it over, write down questions. We'll save all the questions for after the second session. So things that are coming to your mind now, write them down before you go have something to eat and forget all about it. And we'll go take a break, and right now we'll stand and bless the food. All right. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Father bless. Christ your God bless the food and give you thy servants who are holy always now and ever to ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, Father.